So we're going to read Psalm 16, and then we'll go into Acts chapter 2. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrow shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. O oh Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You'll show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let me turn into Acts chapter 2. Uh, the Apostle Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, um, explaining why people are observing some of the things they're observing in, in the disciples. But for our purposes, we just want to see how Peter quotes Psalm 16 and uses it to describe Jesus, and in particular, his resurrection. So Acts 2, we're going to start at verse 22, and go to verse 33. Now, this is Peter speaking. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, for seeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh, flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we're all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. These are God's words for us today. But one subject we, uh, we don't like to talk about in our society, I'd suggest probably the most taboo subject uh, of all in our country today, the one we really don't want to reflect and deep, think deeply on at all, which is the simple but undeniable fact that, that one day we will die. One day, unless the Lord Jesus returns first, I know what the end is going to be for you. We're going to end our lives in, 
in death. I think in previous generations, for various reasons, um, people were probably much more ready to face up to that truth. Uh, there's a Latin phrase that used to be used really commonly to describe what was just a very common theme in English literature, memento mori, it's common theme. Remember, you must die. It was a, just a, a common theme in, in literature. Uh, our society, I think, is just very good at, at compartmentalizing death. Um, it's there in hospitals, it's there if you go to crematoriums, but, but generally we can push it out of our minds. Um, you, know, you, can, you, can, you can get on the, bus, uh, on the bus and you've got your phone to occupy you in, in a thousand different ways. You can get in the car and there's always the radio option. You never have to sit in silence. You don't have to face uh, mortality, stare it in the face. Um, I think our society does this in strange ways. Uh, uh, why is it? What is, why, why is it that... That, have you noticed that Halloween is becoming a bigger and bigger thing? I think it's probably the second biggest festival in our country now. You noticed it seems to have turned into a month long. And yet in Halloween, we can make these lighthearted jokes about chainsaw massacres and witches and skulls and skeletons and, and deaths. And I suspect, and this is just my opinion, people are doing that to avoid the ugly reality of what death really is all about, just making a making a lighthearted joke of it all as a way of, of avoiding confronting it. We don't want to think about that lingering question, but, but that is precisely what I want us to do this morning. It's precisely what this Psalm, Psalm 16, calls us to do. Now, this might strike you as quite a morbid thing. Um, I, I wouldn't blame you if you came to church, if you were sitting here right now thinking, I came to church this morning, wanting to feel happier or more peaceful, whatever it is. I didn't come expecting to be confronted with, with the reality of death, but I hope by the end you'll say this is not a, a morbid, uh, grotesque, uh, sad thing we're thinking about, because when we're prepared for it, do you know, it's not just that we don't have to be afraid of it. Actually, there's so much more than that that when we think about it, we can think about it with a sense of joy. So that, that's one of the, the really striking things about Psalm 16, that, that you read it, and it's about death, and yet it is such a happy psalm. Um, David wrote lots of other psalms. You know, so many of the messianic, messianic psalms uh, that David writes from his own experience and his own life are just filled with sadness, uh, grief, loneliness, troubles, pain. The Bible never pretends those things aren't there and real for us, but, but Psalm 16 just isn't one of those psalms. Psalm 16 is a really happy psalm. Uh, you can just tell David's bursting with joy as he sings this. Uh, you can see it in verse 2. Uh, he's singing about the Lord and he's singing about all the goodness he receives from him. You see in verse three, where he talks about the delights that he enjoys. He uses the word delight. You see it in verse six, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. And how about this in verse nine? My heart is glad. My glory rejoices. If there's any doubt how David's feeling, but he tells us how he feels. My heart is glad. As he sings Psalm 16, he's got a smile on his face, and yet he is also singing about his impending death. And that, that surely makes us, what gives? What's going on there? He's singing about his death, and we can see that when you start by looking at verse 1, his opening prayer is, preserve me, O God. Or you might have, keep me safe, O God in your Bible. You're only asked to be preserved. Well, you need to be preserved from something, don't you? Keep me safe from something. And it's in verse 10, he tells us what's on his mind. It's Sheol. Sheol is not a word we use in our modern day and age. Um, but Sheol in the Bible is the place of the dead, uh, the grave that David is facing up to the reality that he's going to die, that he is going to enter this place, Sheol, the place where all dead people go. It's looming on the horizon. 
David knows it. No fitness regime, no healthcare system, no, no well-being eating plan can prevent the inevitable. We're going to deteriorate. We face the grave. That's what David's thinking about. Uh, David, to say, he, he calls this world Sheol, uh, the afterlife. This is a place that includes both heaven and hell. It's just a place where all dead people go. I think if many of us, if we were going to compose a song about this, it, it wouldn't have the same sense, perhaps, of joy that David has in Psalm 16. And yet he uses words like delight, glad, rejoice. Surely you've got to ask, what's going on here? And, and you know, if, if you've come to church this morning and, and you're not a Christian, or if you're not sure what you think, I hope at the very least you'll say, I want what he has. I, I can't avoid this either. I want what that man has. And the good news is you can. You, there's nothing David has here that we can't have too. So there is one thing that makes all the difference in David's life. You, you see it in the, the first verse or two. It's the relationship David has with God. Uh, it's not just that David believes in God that he believes God exists. That's quite a common thing. Lots of people today believe that God exists. Maybe you believe that God exists. That doesn't change anything. It makes no difference at all in and of itself if you believe in God or not. What comforts God, it, what comforts David is that he knows God personally. So verse one, in you I put my trust. There's a relationship of trust there. Verse two, uh, in verse two, he's talking in the, in the past tense. I think he's, he's looking back to a time in his life where, where he put his trust actively in God. Oh, my soul, as if he's talking to himself, re recalling the past. You have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. Lord, when, when it says Lord with small letters, Lord just means master. He's talking to God, saying, you're my master. I made a decision that I'm going to follow you and obey you. That I'm going to trust you for everything. He can see back to that time when he made that decision, where he nailed his colours to the mass. And he's not just saying, you're the Lord, you're, you're the ruler, the creator. He's saying, no, you're, you're my Lord. This is personal. That's what makes all the difference for David as he approaches death. David has this relationship with God, the Lord, the creator. He's his friend, his refuge, his, his protector. I think David's writing this psalm. I can't prove this. The introduction doesn't tell us. But I think when you put the pieces together, it seems very likely that David's writing this as the end of his life is drawing near, as he's reflecting back over his life, thinking about the experiences he's had, the people he's, he's known. Um, so at the end of verse two, he says, my goodness is nothing apart from you. Or uh, the NIV puts it this way, apart from you, I have no good thing. So he's thinking about all the good things he's enjoyed in his life, all the blessings God showered out down on him, and he's just giving thanks for them. And as we go through the psalm, I can see, I will pick these out for a few minutes, uh, uh, three things that he's giving thanks for as he reflects back over his life. Uh, firstly, David finds delight in God's people. He can give thanks for God's people, the people of the Lord he's known. You find that in verses three and four. Uh, David talks here about the saints, as for the saints who are in the earth. Saints, we're not talking about, um, we're not talking about, you know, when people talk about saint, whoever it is, um, suggests that people do that in a way that suggests that ordinary Christians aren't saints. When the Bible uses saints, well, a saint is a Christian and a Christian is a saint. So, so David is looking at other believers, people he knows in Israel who don't just go through the motions and, and carry out the rituals, but people who trust God personally like he does. He describes them as saints. And and he says, these, these kindred spirits I have. Notice how he describes them. Verse 3, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. Do you know that's one of the hallmarks of a Christian, a real Christian, to take great delight in others, 
in other believers, others who trust the Lord. It's good to stop and do that, to stop and actively think to yourself this morning, if you're a Christian, to give thanks for the believers the Lord has placed in your life. And I'd say, oh, they're the excellent ones. They're the ones in whom is all my delight. Oh, I thank the Lord for the, the, those Christians who just set such an example of godliness to me. Oh, what great delight I take in, in seeing how they live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And all oh, those believers who were, they were there for me in my trials and they sat with me and they prayed with me and they, they wept for me. Oh, how I delight in those memories and in the, the preciousness of those times. Those times when we've stood and we've sung together as a church. What a joy that is. David's thinking of those sorts of experiences in his life. We can do the same today. Not in a way that means we overlook each other's sins or we put each other on pedestal. Oh, of course not. We're, we're sinners. We, we know that. But oh, what great delight we can find as we see God working in each other's lives. The, the contrast for David is, is really big. When In verse 4, David talks here about, about the opposite type of person. He describes those who hasten after another God. And he says for them, all that their sorrows shall be multiplied. Uh, he goes on to talk about their drink offerings of blood. So other pagan religions of the day would, uh, would offer blood sacrifices, and they'd actually drink this animal blood that they were offering. To, it, it, was, it was quite a disgusting ritual. And, and David, for all sorts of reasons, is just, I'm having nothing to do with that. Not only that, it, it just fills them with sorrow. It doesn't even make them truly joyful like I got to, That's what David's saying. And then secondly, in verses five and six, David takes delight in God's provision for him. There's five and six. In these verses, David uses lots of geographical language. Um, and it's all language drawn from the period of Israel's history when, when Israel inherited the land of Canaan. So this sort of geographical speak. So when he talks about things like the portion of my inheritance, um, well, this, was, this is land terms. This is that, you know, your inheritance was land. Your father would pass land on to you and it would have boundaries and so on. And then you'd pass the land on and so on. It's all, this is geographical language. Um, so the lines, when he's talking about the lines falling in pleasant places, this is boundary lines. This is, this is the place you've given to me, my possession, my land. And he says, it's good. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. Some people sometimes ask us, um, you might even ask us, you're free to ask us this question, after people say, well, do you like living up in Nelson? Um, when people up in Nelson here, we used to live in Cardiff. It's a big change, isn't it? Big city. And then when people here, Ros used to live in London, oh, even bigger change. And you know, there's, there's good things about both. I think that's not a surprising thing. Um, we, we love that in any direction from our house, five minutes, we're in the countryside. We, we're in woodland and forest. You know, there's the sheep a couple of minutes and horses just down there, you know, two minutes down from, from our house. Um, we love that. We love the peace and quiet. We love the, the sense of community. It's hard for us to walk to the shops in the centre of the village without seeing someone we know. But... I'm not saying that Nelson's the most beautiful place in the world. It's not. Um, no one there will mind me saying that, I'm sure. I'm sure there are places with lower crime rates than Nelson as well. David here, then it, David's not saying, I literally live in the best place in the world. There's nowhere more beautiful, no more, more peaceful. No, he's not being unrealistic in the same way as, well, it's not as if Cardiff is the most beautiful city in the world. I mean, one well, of those are great things about it. What David's saying is that just he looks around him and he thinks of the geography and the land, but it goes further than that. He's thinking about all his life circumstances, the, the, the place he's been put in. He's saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to be thankful and I'm going to be at peace with the, the place you've put me in. Do you know that's a challenge for us today? Wherever we live, can you say that about your situation? Lord, this is the place you've put me in. This is the life you've chosen for me. 
and it's pleasant, it's good. I'll, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I trust it's the right thing for me because you're sovereign and these are the circumstances you've placed in my life. This is the family you've chosen for me. This is the place you've given me to live. This is the job you've given me, at least for the present time. Lord, I'm going to choose to be content with this. Not because it's perfect. I mean, remember, David isn't writing this from his ivory tower. It's not as if he inherits this big country pile and, and he just lives there in, in peace. No, David spent lots of time sleeping outside as a shepherd, fighting off all sorts of fierce animals. He goes on the run from King Saul. He sleeps in caves. Uh, he, he faces betrayal from his own son, who tries to take his throne from him. D David suffered in all sorts of ways. But he can look back to, oh, Lord, Lord, you have been good to me, and I will trust you're going to be good to me now as well. And then thirdly, David takes delight in God's counsel, verses 7 to 8. He can just look back, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. In verse, the, the second line, he talks about, my heart also instructs me. Uh, God's given him wisdom, advice, counsel. Times, David says, there were times when I just didn't know what to do. And I would turn to God and cry out, please help me. Please rescue me. Please just tell me what. Please guide me. I said, well, the Lord did give me counsel. He did guide me. There are times in the Christian life that are like that. There are times when we're at a crossroads and we don't know what to do. But God's promise, God's promise to every one of his children, he, he will guide you. He will show you a way through the fog as you look to him. It's not just the the, uh, the sunny, easy decisions of life that David's thinking about, you know, the um, should I have the extra sprinkles on the ice cream sort of decision. Oh, what a decision. No, it, it's the big decisions David's thinking about because he talks in the verse seven, my heart also instructs me in the night seasons, in the times of darkness. David says, oh, you were holding my hand there. You were instructing me then. And if you are in a time of darkness, but you are trusting the Lord, he will instruct you too. So David's looking back on his life. And you can see how this friendship with God has made all the difference. And now he's looking ahead and he sees one more great trial facing him. It's the trial that John Bunyan describes in in Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan calls it the river of death. Um, a Christian can see the gate to heaven ahead of him. All that stands between him and the gate to heaven is this river. That's how John Bunyan describes it, as it was a deep river, dark and cold, and there was no bridge. At the sight of the river, the pilgrims turned pale and were silent. And they're told, you must go through or you will never get to the gates. So Christian and his, his companion, uh, hopeful, um, they step down into the water. And I, I love how realistic John Bunyan is about this in his account, because he, he talks about Christian's fear. Christian is trembling as he steps down into the water, because it really is a terrifying experience. As he does it, he remembers God's promise as well. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. He's quoting Isaiah 43, verse 2. Before they know it, they've reached the other side. David is thinking about, he's approaching his own death. And verses 9 to 11, that's what he describes. Verse 9, he says he knows his flesh will also rest. David knows his body is going to rest. What he means is it's going to stop working. You know, your body's active, it's moving, it's not resting right now, your heart's still beating. But David says, I know there's going to be a time when, when my body wears out and it is going to lie there uh, motionless one day. My body is going to rest. But how? My body will rest, my flesh will rest in hope. Verse 10, he says, you will not leave my soul 
in Sheol, the Sheol, the place of the dead. So he's saying, yes, I know I have to enter that place. I know I have to go through the river of death. I have to experience. But as I experience it, you're not going to leave me there. You're not going to be abandoning me at that point. It says in verse 11, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. David knows after that, after the river of death, what's on the other side? I'm going to be in your presence. And it's going to be full of joy. It's going to be experiencing the pleasures of God. And death won't put an end to that. So this is a psalm then, when David, as David looks at the future, he's expressing his confidence that in that moment that his, his body comes to a rest, God's going to be holding my hand. And that's why this is a psalm we can make our own. As we think about the future, as we pass through the valley of death, we, we know it's coming unless the Lord Jesus returns first. I'm going to be with every one of my children. And you know, these things can be yours if you will put your trust in him for yourself. Now, every, every messianic psalm is about David. We've talked about what David meant for his own life as he wrote it. And we've talked about what it means for ourselves. We've tried to draw out some of the lessons for ourselves as we've gone through this. But every messianic psalm is also, by its very nature, about Jesus. So it's about David. It's about us. It's about Jesus, too. So you can trace, as we said earlier, when you trace Jesus' life through the Psalms, you see right from his birth, his life, his teaching, his miracles, his betrayal, his mocking, his crucifixion, and how he, how he dies. Um, in this Psalm, it describes what happens next after he dies. What happened when Jesus died? Where did he go? Where was Jesus between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. There's been some confusion on this subject, and the reason for that is that there is a very famous, probably the most famous Christian creed, of course, called the Apostles' Creed, it dates back to about the third century AD. The Apostles' Creed has one phrase in it that says that after Jesus died, he descended into hell. Did he? Is that what happened? Did he go to hell, a place of eternal torment and pain? and suffering? And the answer is no. And actually, when, the people, when those people wrote the Apostles' Creed, that wasn't what they were trying to say either. Uh, the reason they used that word hell is because it's very similar to the word Hades, which is the New Testament version of Sheol. So what they were trying to say, and in fact what the Bible teaches, is that Jesus did not descend into hell, but he did go to Sheol, the place of the dead. In other words, what it's really saying is, he really did die. We know from what he said to the thief on the cross, he was in paradise during that period between the Friday and the Sunday. He was in heaven. But he really did go to Sheol. He really did suffer death and experience it. So we go to Acts chapter 2. If, you, if you're following with your own Bible in front of you, you might want to turn to Acts chapter 2 just for a couple of minutes, because in these verses, um, verses 25 to 28, that, that Peter quotes the last few verses of Psalm 16, and he says, that psalm, those verses, are talking all about Jesus. Those final few verses of Psalm 16, Peter quotes them there. And Peter's point is the same as David's point. So so when David says in verse 10, you will not leave my soul in Sheol, uh, you won't abandon me to be uh, corrupted in the grave, Peter says in its fullest sense, this is talking about Jesus. So if we pick it up in Acts 2 verse 29, where, where Peter's preaching, uh, the, really what, he, what he's saying there, when he says, when I'm speaking to you about the patriarch David, he's both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us, to this day. Why is Peter saying that? They all know that David's dead and buried. They know he died. Peter's point is, yes, David with, is with the Lord. And yes, David could take great comfort that he wasn't going to be abandoned in the grave. But do you know his body is still there? That's what Peter's saying. Um, he, he's, the point he's making is, his tomb's with us to this day. If you really wanted, you could go and find David's grave. 
And if you really wanted to, to dig it, you could find his bones. His body's still there. He's not come back. He's not appeared to anyone. David has not yet experienced physical resurrection. So Peter goes on. That's 2 verse 31. He says, really, in its fullest sense, Psalm 16 is describing Jesus. Verse 31. This is, this is you speaking about the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, Sheol, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus, God has raised up. You see the difference? Yes, David can say, you won't abandon me. And God didn't abandon him. That's true of Jesus. But do you know what more we can say of Jesus? It's that Jesus's body was not left in the grave. They could go to the tomb that Easter Sunday morning and they could dig and search. And they're not going to find a body there. Jesus is raised from the dead. Peter says this is all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he goes to the place of the dead. But oh, he doesn't stay there. He's not still in the grave today. He's raised. He receives a new resurrection body. The promise is for everyone who believes. David, for us, will receive a new resurrection body too. Bodies that don't get ill, bodies that don't age, bodies that don't decay, bodies that don't die. So that's the promise of the world to come. New bodies. Jesus gets it first. But everyone who follows him receives that too. Now let me just try and wrap things up for the last few minutes. Um, about how David, David had a son called Solomon, and Solomon saw his father, David, grow old. And there comes a day, you can read about this in the Old Testament, where, where David knows that his time is near. So David goes to Solomon and, and he says, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. So it's interesting, David knows, he just knows his time is, is coming. So he starts to prepare, he starts to hand the throne over to, to some Solomon. Solomon sees his father, David, die. I think Solomon learned a lot about death. He must have done from his father. David must have passed on all sorts of wisdom to, to Solomon. So when Solomon grew up, he collected various proverbs, wisdom writings together. Here's one of the things Solomon wrote, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 1. The day of death is better than the day of birth. Think about that. How could Solomon write that? The day of death is better than the day of birth. And that just grates against so much of our natural thinking, doesn't it? That the day of your death could be better than the day of your birth. Do you know it's not true of everyone? Let me give you another statement from the New Testament now. Words from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, Matthew 26, where Jesus uses the same word, better, but he flips things around completely. Jesus speaks about Judas, and he says it would have been better for him if he had not been born. And see the, the huge contrast for Judas. The day of his death was not better than the day of his birth. It was far, far worse. It's, um, it's a Puritan writer called William Perkins who picks up on these two verses and makes this, this contrast. The point he's making is that that for a Christian, in fact, for everyone, the day of our birth is a day when we enter into a world full of misery and sin and sadness and pain. But for a Christian, the day of your death is an entrance into a world full of eternal life, joy. Remember how David puts it at the end of his psalm? In your presence is fullness of joy. Your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So you know, the, the greatest joy and happiness we've enjoyed in this world, they're, they're shadows, they're pale reflections of what's yet to come. Yet one of these two sentences will be said of each one of us. One of those sentences will be said of, or could be said of you. Will God say of you, it would have been better for him or her Never to have been born. Why would God say that of someone? I'll give you one reason. 
Because they came to church and they sat in church and they heard about everything they needed. They heard of a God who stands ready to pour out his forgiveness and his grace into their lives. A God who, who held out this offer of friendship, said, I'm ready to forgive you and love you and welcome you into my arms and guide you and take, I'm ready to do all of it. And they heard it in church and they walked away from it and said, no, or not today. There are people who hear and then they die. And the day of that, uh, it would have been better, Jesus says, to have never been born. What a tragedy. Don't let that happen to you. I recently heard of a, I uh, recently read a book, a book called Homeward Bound. I finished talk by just talking about this. Uh, it's a book by a man who's, whose wife, uh, at a young age in her 20s, had an inoperable brain tumour. There's nothing the doctors can do. Um, so this is a book written by the man uh, writing about his wife. And he records that the last, he said, talk about the last conversation he ever had with her. Just the last conversation I had with her, with Amy, his wife, was at the hospital in the middle of the night, about three weeks before she died. And I said, sweetheart, do you know what's happening to you? She nodded her head slowly, but deliberately. She said, I'm going home. As to how she felt about that, with a quiet calm, she simply said, I'm okay. I know who I'm going to see. And she drifted off to sleep. It's God's friendship. It just takes the sting out of death. That's how the Bible puts it. And it's true. It takes the sting out of death. Yes, the waters are cold and dark and scary and I'm swirling, but there's no sting left to it. I can say what, what David says. Oh, you're, you're my Lord. It's friendship with God that promises resurrection. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead, he promises well, the same will happen for you on that moment. If you will trust him. That's why David can say, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore.